Thank you. I'm a developer at Oracle. I'm based in uh, Colorado. Oracle has put out a number of cloud apps. A number of those are powered by Spark on the back end. And in particular, I'm a developer on big data preparation, which is data cleansing, data preparation in the cloud. There are a number of competitors, of course, to such a product, but the calling card for big data prep is it's uh, machine learning, natural language processing, and graph technologies, which is actually indicated in the application logo. Uh, as for the book, it's finally coming out. So tomorrow, the ebook will be out next week. The print book will start shipping in two weeks. Uh, Amazon will start shipping. Part of the delay is that I did a stop the presses so I could insert a section on graph frames. All right, so let's dig right in. And just to be clear, when we say graphs, we mean edges and vertices, not, not stock uh, charts. Uh, so this is the stack I'm using, and of course the big difference between GraphX and GraphFrames is GraphX uses RDDs, GraphFrames uses uh, data frames. Uh, now when we talk about graphs and GraphX and GraphFrames, just like everything else in Spark, they're immutable. You can't like add an edge or add a vertex. If you want to do that, you need a full-fledged graph database like Neo4j, Titan, or OrientDB. The big thing that GraphFrames adds over GraphX is the ability to query. Uh, for some history, uh, with Spark 2.0, Bagel is finally being put to rest. Uh, GraphFrames, at this point, is available as a Spark package. It's not part of Spark 2.0. So Spark 2.0, the only official graph system is GraphX. Uh, Bagel was just a simple uh, Pragel API interface layer. GraphX added a lot more. It added a generalized MapReduce API called Aggregate Messages, so you could have more general algorithms uh, with various terminating conditions. In Pragel, you were limited to the terminating condition of uh, there are no more messages being sent. Uh, GraphX lets you implement algorithms then uh, that operated on both vertex properties and edge properties, and it introduced the um, routing table for rapidly generating tables of triplets. Um, Graph frames, instead of the routing table, has the materialized views, like Ankur just, just showed. Um, but most of the performance, or a lot of the performance uh, from graph frames comes from the fact that it uses data frames, which uses Catalyst and Tungsten. Besides performance, the other two big things graph frames adds are the non scala languages, Java and Python, uh, as well as querying. So those are the big three things. Now performance, uh, let's drill down into that. So uh, the performance improvement in just RDDs in general to data frames might be a 10x improvement. If you Google this, the, the top hits you'll see will show it's only a 2x improvement, but that's really only between RDDs and 1.4 data frames. A lot of tungsten actually didn't go in until 1.5, and I've seen some benchmarks that show a 3x improvement just between 1.4 tungsten and 1.5 tungsten, so that would be like 6x total. And personally, anecdotally, I've seen um, an 8x improvement going from GraphX on RDDs to graph frames, and that's not even considering the whole stage code generation we've heard over and over again at the Spark Summit, uh, you know, which is reported to be a 10x improvement. And then if we want to go back into prehistory uh, to Apache Giraffe, which was uh, used the old Hadoop, uh, disk-based Hadoop MapReduce, uh, nothing to do with Spark, there was a 10x improvement from uh, Giraffe over to Spark GraphX. So we might be looking at three orders of magnitude improvement here. Uh, querying. So if we wanted to find the friends of the friends of Anne, of course the answer is Charles. If we wanted to do that in GraphX, it would require a ton of code, just because GraphX is not set up for querying, though it is possible. So I just want to look at uh, two systems where it is reasonable, Neo4j and GraphFrame. So again, Neo4j is a standalone graph database, nothing to do with Spark. Uh, it has this very rich querying language called Cypher, and actually GraphFrame's implements a subset of Cypher. GraphFrames calls them motifs, but it's a very tiny subset. So because Neo4j has this rich version of Cypher, that's why its query is very short and concise. Now, the calling card of Cypher is that it, uh, you express queries in this ASCII art. So vertices are represented by round parentheses, edge properties by square brackets, and the edges themselves by hyphens and arrows. And so there are two things in particular that make the Neo4j query shorter here. One is that, uh, notice we can embed that string literal and directly 
inside of our ASCII art, whereas in graph frames, which has the more limited cipher, we have to filter out for AND using SQL, since we have access to SQL and data frames, as a post-processing step after our cipher query. The other thing is uh, the multiplicity. Remember, we were looking for friend of a friend, so that's a two hops. We can express those two hops directly with the number two in uh, Neo4j cipher 2.2, whereas in graph frames, we actually have to draw out two edges uh, using our ASCII art in cipher. All right, so we're actually here to talk about isomorphism. So what is an isomorphism? Well, it just says that we can take the graph on the left, untangle it, and come up with the same graph on the right, ignoring vertex names. And you might have seen in the news last December that a researcher figured out how to answer that question in quasi-polynomial time, except that's not actually what I'm gonna be talking about today, that problem. So I'm not going to be talking about the problem of you have big graph A and big graph B, are they isomorphic? Instead, I'm gonna be talking about the problem, you have big graph A, are there little tiny subgraphs in big graph A that are isomorphic to each other? And so the motivating example, which I stole from the Yago website, is if X and Y share a common child, can we say with some probability that they're married? And so this is actually more properly called rule mining, and here's some other words you can Google from adjacent subjects. Now the data we're gonna be using uh, for my presentation is Yago. Uh, it looks like this, except it has 500 million edges and it's derived from these four data sources. It's distributed as 90 gigabytes over 76 TSV files. I'm gonna be looking only at these three in particular. Yago Fax is where all the fun stuff happens. Yago Labels has the human readable versions of some of the Yago vertices. Here you see one in French and another in English. And Yago ta Taxonomy has all the ISA relationships, IS hyphen A. Now we want, need to read this into GraphX and graph frames, and so we actually have to write a couple of custom functions to do that, read RDF and merge graphs. The reason is because you know, this data is all just string literals, and everything in GraphX and graph frames is based on vertex IDs. So uh, the first thing we have to do is we have to come up with a mapping of vertex names to vertex IDs. We do that with zip with index, and then it's just a couple of joints. And it's actually the same approach in both GraphX and graph frames. So the reason the graph frames code is so much longer is because graph frames being based on data frames uh, is typed at runtime. The algorithm for merge graphs is much the same. The reason we need merge graphs is because we have these multiple TSV files coming out of Yago. We wanna read in one TSV file, create graph A, read another TSV file, create graph B, and merge them together, mer overlapping the common vertices. And so the, the, the approach is just the same as read RDF. We just need to come up with uh, an index uh, to map the vertex names to vertex IDs, and then it's just a couple of joins. All right, so let's finally dig into some examples. So I have one example in GraphX and four examples in graph frames. All right, so we have some countries, and uh, various countries have different various exported items. So uh, can we say that based on that France exports aircraft and chemical, and that Canada exports aircraft, can we infer with some probability that Canada exports chemical? Now, if we just put aside the fact that um, you know, this is graph data, and look at this as just a regular data problem, this is really just like a Netflix recommender engine problem where the countries are Netflix viewers and the exported items are the Netflix films. And there, there are a couple of recommender engines built into Spark. You may be familiar with ALS. There's a lesser known one called SVD++ that's part of GraphX. And so this is gonna be our, our data flow. So we only need to read the yagofax.tsv file and from that we extract these pairs of items, countries, and exported items, again, countries are like the Netflix viewers, and the uh, exported items are like the Netflix, Netflix films. We pump those pairs into SVD++ to train up a model from which we can make predictions. And the predictions we're interested in, in, in this example, are we're gonna take Canada as our example country, and pair with that every possible export and get a prediction score out of it and see what our top ranking uh, prediction is. Uh, top ranking score for exports, and it turns out to be uh, electronic equipment. So this is saying that electronic equipment is missing from the Yago data, which means it's probably missing from the Wikipedia data, at least when the Yago took its snapshot. 
which definitely sounds like missing data because Canada has Research in Motion, which exports Blackberries. So how can this be? Is it really true? And we can confirm that with GREP. It's really missing. We'll look up some reference data on exports and match them up. And there's some uh, correspondence there, but it just completely misses number five above all the ones that it does hit, number five electronic equipment. So this, this example is a successful uh, rule mining exercise. So now let's go look at the four examples in graph frames. All right, so in GraphX, we were able to look at basically two vertices at a time. Because we have the cipher query language and it's ASCII art, we can look at things that are bigger. So we're going to be looking at three vertices at a time. And in this motivating example, if Plato influences Kant and Kant influences Foucault, can we then infer that Plato influences Foucault? So in our approach, we're going to define some terms here. So we're going to call an absent triangle where that third edge is missing and a present triangle where that third edge is present. And then we're going to be computing this ratio for every possible vertex A, uh, the ratio of the present triangles over total triangles. And the idea being that if this ratio is high and we find an A with a missing edge, maybe that edge probably should be actually put in there. So this is the cipher to do that. Look first at the second one. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. It just says all three edges have to be present. Uh, the cipher query for the absent introduces uh, a syntax uh, that we haven't touched on in this presentation yet, which is the exclamation point. It says that edge should not be present. Now, just as a digression, when I was first getting my initial results out of this, I was getting a lot of uh, names and philosophers that I did not know. And I wanted to make sure when I got my results, there were people I knew. So I said, okay, well, let's make sure that all the vertices I'm dealing with have a high out degree. It's kind of a poor man's page rank. And even though there's an out degree function in graph frames, I just wanted to show how easy it is to do things like this in graph frames because you have access to SQL in graph frames. And it's just a, a group I encounter. Okay, so the score. So remember our score is a composite of two things. One is that ratio uh, that says, you know, you, where you have a high number of present triangles over total triangles combined with um, the out degree. And so the winner of that competition is Plato. So Plato both has a high number of present triangles percentage-wise and is well known. So given Plato is our A, now let's find C's um, that are well known and see where the, uh, there's no edge from A to C. And the winners of that competition are Marx, Sartre, and Foucault. Well, Marx and Sartre certainly knew Plato very well. They rejected him outright. So we definitely don't want to say that uh, Plato influenced them. As for Foucault, he did speak, speak favorably of Plato's dialogues, but that was towards the end of his career after he had established his own philosophy. So it's kind of well, maybe we should put an influences edge there. So this is kind of maybe a partial victory for, uh, for rule mining. So instead of looking at just only the influences edge type, let's completely generalize this and see if there's some edge type out there, E1, such that whenever we see an E1, we'll just automatically glom on an E2 and V3 of some other particular edge type in vertex. So to uh, answer this question, we need to read in Yago and multiple files. Here we're reading three files out of Yago. And I'm making use of that read RDF and merge graphs that I showed previously, but I have a little helper function here. Notice that I've defined Yago as a var rather than a val. So I'm just sort of incrementally glomming on extra TSV files on, onto my Yago. Uh, but the, the thing that uh, merge into Yago helps out with is, is the ca strict cache control, which is important for uh, any iterative or incremental uh, graph X or graph frames uh, coding. So again, we're going to be computing a ratio uh, similar to the previous one. In this, in this case, the ratio is uh, the denominator, the total number of uh, E1s, and the numerator is the total number of specific patterns of E1, E2, and V3. So to compute this ratio uh, globally for all the various types, um, I do this with a, with a, a massive join. So the, the outside of the join, the top line, is the ASCII art to compute the numerator. And the inside of the join is the denominator. And we don't actually have to use Cypher to compute the denominator because it's just a group by edge type. And then once, once they're joined together, then uh, you, know, you just divide out and get the ratio. 
Okay, so here are the results, and they're actually not very interesting. So the top four results are simply uh, a reminder of the painful fact that uh, most figures, recorded figures in history are male. So let's start with the fifth one, and let's try and plug in a mental example of what that fifth one is saying. So if John is a citizen of Canada, can we then infer that Canada participated in the war on terror? Well, no, that really doesn't make much sense, even though supposedly there's an 84% probability of that being true. And actually, most of the rest of these are along those same lines. It's, it's not useful, except, wait, what are these things at the bottom? So take the next to the last one uh, that I've highlighted and uh, with a mental example. So if, if France has an official language of French, can we say that the human readable label of French is Joseph. I was like, what is going on there? It took me an hour to debug this, and I debugged it all the way back to Yago. So this is actually a success, but not, maybe not one we were expecting. Uh, we actually found a bug in our data. All right, so instead of just three vertices, let's try and extend this to four vertices. Maybe if we have the context of E3, uh, maybe that will come up with something a bit more reasonable. Um, so, in this case, the, the cipher query now has three edges and so forth, but the result is I actually ran out of memory on my one terabyte of RAM, and that's kind of because when you do these general uh, cipher queries, it, it's combinatorial, so there's a combinatorial explosion. So, in the next example, we'll see how to maybe kind of work around that, where um, you can pre-filter to, to uh, keep the memory usage lower. So going back to that um, motivating example from Yago, can we infer that X is married to Y? So um, here are the, the initial approach, initial results. So uh, you know, this is following sort of a best, uh, you know, best use pattern um, of pre-filter, cipher, and post-filter. So the pre-filter, I make sure I'm grabbing only the has child and is married to edges out of the graph so that when the cipher query runs, it won't run out of, run out of memory. Uh, but after the cipher query, I still need a post filter to make sure that the right edges are with the right parts of the cipher query. And the results uh, kind of have a little problem here. So if you look at the third line, uh, it says that maybe George VI should be married to George VI of the United Kingdom. So the right way to solve that problem would be to bring in yet another TSV file out of, out of Yago that contains all the Wikipedia page redirects. But I was too lazy to do that, and I took a shortcut. Uh, and this is probably a good assumption for historical figures that one parent is male and the other parent is female. So I just changed my pre-filtering step here to include those three edges. Uh, and then uh, my cipher uh, stage uh, now has four edges uh, that I'm, I'm looking for patterns of four edges at a time in my cipher query. And then I still need to post filter to make sure, um, you know, for example, that edge E1 is still uh, is, has gender as opposed to is married to. And the results for that, uh, the thing that jumps right out uh, to me at first is what? Ozzy and Sharon Osbourne aren't married? Well, of course they are. So. Uh, that, that would be a success for rule mining. It found a problem uh, in the Yago data, which means it, there might be a problem in the, in the Wikipedia data. So those are all the examples. I just wanna uh, hand out a couple of AWS tips. So this will be like old news to anybody who's used to AWS, but if you're new, um, the first thing is to, you know, there are different instance types you can get on AWS. Make sure you get an instance type that has SSD. So we frequently hear the refrain that Spark is in memory, but that's actually only true for the map side. For the reduce slash shuffle side, it's always disk-based, and sometimes people will complain about this on the mailing list, and the Spark experts will come back and say, well, you can just use an SSD, get over it. So when you're, when you're on AWS, make sure you're getting an SSD. Um, the other thing is if you know, your, your stuff is running slow, you think, well, let me just add some nodes to my cluster and scale out. Well, that won't help if you, actually, if you have some straggler tasks. If you have that one task that's just like taking a long time with, within your parallel processing. 
Um, so the, the solution to that is to more finely partition your data. You know, the the hard-coded partition number in Spark is 200. And like in my cluster, I had four nodes of 32 cores each. So that was 120 cores against 200 partitions. That's not enough partitions. The general rule of thumb is you want to have at least three times the number of partitions as cores. And the reason for that is to give the Spark scheduler something to work with, something to bin pack. And so we all know how to repartition RDDs and data frames. But again, that's really only for the map side. For the shuffle slash reduce side, you have to use this slightly lesser known syntax. And uh, that's pretty much it. So in summary, um, we talked about mini isomorphisms, AKA rule mining, and how they were effective at data quality and data cleansing, and how they're good for recommendations. And I use that in a very broad term. They can identify market opportunities. They can do fraud alerts. We didn't talk about fraud alerts, but the general idea there is if you know one fraudster, you can look at the graph structure surrounding him. And if you see that graph structure somewhere else, maybe that is pointing to another fraudster. Uh, you can do these, uh, this rule mining in graph X, but really only pairs of uh, vertices at a time for more than that. Uh, uh, you really need to use uh, cipher, the cipher subset in graph frames. And uh, that's it. You can download the source code. Half of it is uh, available on the book website, and that's actually available to download for free for anyone. And the other half is on my gist. So thank you. Thank you, Mike.